Good morning. We have some questions that various friends have submitted, and so I'll be reading them and then translating them for Ajahn Buddha Das, and he'll he'll respond. First question is, what is necessary for the person who is now ignorant and wants to understand Dhamma? First of all, the the person who, who is totally stupid will not at all be interested in Dhamma. If you are really ignorant, you won't have any desire to understand Dhamma. To want to understand Dhamma, one needs to have at least begun to see Dhamma a little bit and understand its importance, its necessity. So the person who wants to understand Dhamma is not totally ignorant. There's already some wisdom at work. The place to begin is to know one's own problems. We start by understanding our own problems in order to study the Dhamma to solve those problems. Dhamma is not anything abstract. We're not learning it in that way. We learn Dhamma specifically to solve our problems. So one begins by knowing what one's problems are, and then one proceeds to find the Dhamma that will solve those problems. The next question is, when we see negative things like greed, lust, etc., in ourselves, what we should what should we do after acknowledging these? We have two basic instincts. One is to fight and one is to flee. So when we have a problem, our two basic responses are either to run away from the problem or to struggle with it. Now, the external enemy and the internal enemy are different. But when it's an internal enemy or danger, meaning the defilements of greed, hatred, delusion, then one needs to look at the problem. Is one able to to meet it and deal with it? What, does one have a way of coping with the problem? If one does, then of course one goes and deals with it. However, if one has no way or if the problem is too much for us, then we should retreat. We should do something to get out of its danger. So this is brings us back to the first thing to do is to know our own problem. Know one's own problem. Is it a problem one is capable of dealing with? Or is it too much? If it's too much, then run away from it. Which means here, don't pay any attention to it. Or don't be interested in it. You don't don't deny it, but don't be interested in it. But if one sees a way of <clears throat> dealing with it, then one deals with it. And this is wisdom, to, to see a way to really solve the problem is wisdom. And then one, one gets in there and you deal with it, even if it's kind of a struggle. And if one does it with the right attitude, it's quite enjoyable. It's quite fun to solve these problems. 
For the most part, we only know the childish problems. We know the superficial problems of illness and death, things like external problems. These are the only ones we're aware of that we pay much attention to. For the most part, we're not very much aware of the real problems, the deeper problems, the problems of greed, anger, fear, worry, and so on. If we're unaware of these or uninterested in them, then of course we don't have much chance to, to solve them. So for the most, most part we've got, we're more interested in the kind of childish problems. And so we need to also become aware of the deeper, more serious problems of the defilements. In short, we know only the material problems, the economic problems, the political problems. We're pretty much oblivious to the mental problems and the spiritual problems. The next question. I have difficulties with the concept of our mind monitoring itself or watching itself. The Buddha disposed of the reflexivity of the self. Does not this reflexivity, the mind watching itself, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the question. <laughs> thought I could figure it out. But I'm going to rephrase it and hopefully this is close enough. It seems the questioner is asking, does this observation of the mind actually give rise to some kind of self-consciousness or some kind of egoism? I hope that's close enough. Whenever we get interested in something, whenever we want something, then of course the self arises. When there's an interest or a desire in any way, then the self will arise regarding that interest or desire. And this is a self that we must let go of just like any other self. And then even when we take an interest in the mind or take an interest in Dhamma practice and we have some desire to practice, then even then this self will be, will be born. So if by this reflexivity the questioner is talking about in being mindful in this effort to pay attention to the mind, in this striving and all this, then of course self arises. And so there's the interest to, to practice and then there's getting results from the practice and there's liking this, not liking that. There's satisfaction in some results. This will be happening all along. And so these, and then self will be coming up with all of this. So self will be coming up. It's only by, there's only by abandoning the, the big self, the basic instinct or the basic tendency to self, will we let go of all these little selves, these little instances of self that keep arising due to all the experience and experiences in life, those will only be abandoned when we have abandoned the basic attitude or tendency to self in life. We have a basic instinct of self, which is the whole foundation of it all. There's this basic instinct of self, and out of this arises all the momentary selves, all the little egos and eyes and knees that happen throughout the day, throughout our lives. There's this basic instinct which 
in this instinct there's the desire to progress, to develop, to be safe, to have pleasure, to reproduce. All the other instincts come from this basic instinct of self. And then out of that the other, the, the various egos and eyes appear. Next question. You say that the discovery of impermanence is painful. Impermanence is neither painful or pleasurable. It just is. Why do you say this discovery is painful? Discovery of impermanence can also be pleasurable or a relief to the confusion of not knowing. Can it not? Of course, seeing impermanence correctly will, will free one from dukkha. It will end that dukkha when we see the impermanence of something. But seeing that something is impermanent also means that existing with this impermanent thing, that we have to live with this impermanence, we see that that is inherently painful. Now, actually, there are many ways of seeing impermanence. There are ways of seeing impermanence which aren't even really correct or which don't solve our problems. But if we see the, if we really see impermanence, the impermanence which is the true nature of things, then it will lead to the letting go of attachment. It will lead to the fading away and ending of attachment. That's the seeing of impermanence that will, that will quench dukkha. But if seeing impermanence in the wrong way won't, won't end dukkha. We have to see the ugliness and frightening, frightfulness of a thing before we'll even want to transcend it. If we haven't seen the ugliness or fearfulness of something, then we really won't have a desire or an impulse to let go. So seeing impermanence needs to lead to seeing this, the harm and danger in a thing. Otherwise, we won't really let go. We won't get free of it. And so the thing will con continue to cause dukkha for us. So please see three things, not just the one, but see these three things. See impermanence and then want to get free of impermanent things. See dukkha, the fact of dukkha, and then aim to get free of suffering, things which are inherently painful, and realize not self, and then aspire to be free of self. It's better to aim for all three of these instead of just one, for our practice to be complete. I asked a to clarify this a little bit more. When we, is the seeing of impermanence painful? for the mind that sees it. Um, we, in seeing impermanence, there are a progression of insights or of seeing more deeply into impermanence. Now, if we, in seeing impermanence, we see its ugliness, it's the inherent terror of the frightening quality, the danger of impermanent things, then sometimes that can be painful to the mind in seeing that ugliness that's in them. But if we see the way to cope with that, if we see the way to get beyond this ugly quality, then it need not be painful to the mind. So it depends the, on the level or depth of our realization and our understanding. On some levels, 
it can there can still it can be still somewhat painful. But if or on but on some levels it's not. There's a secret that we all need to know. If we don't see impermanence correctly, then we'll go back, we'll return to falling in love with things that are impermanent. I mean, we might let go for a little while, but if our seeing of impermanence is not correct, we'll, we'll fall back into loving those things, that thing again. If one doesn't see dukkha correctly, then one will go back to falling in love with things, with things which are painful, which is really dumb, but it happens. And if we don't see not self correct, if we fail to see not self correctly, then one will keep going back, keep falling into love with things which are not self. When we're in love with impermanent things, there is a kind of happiness, of course, but it's the happiness of ignorance. It's a kind of stupid happiness. When we're in love with things that are impermanent, inherently painful, ugly, and not self, there might be happiness, but it's the happiness of ignorance. This is a very difficult kind of happiness to, to overcome. We need to be very careful. Is this the kind of happiness we have now? Because we fall, it's very easy to fall in love with this kind of happiness. So we need to be very careful of the happiness that falls in love with things which are impermanent, suffering, and not self. Even this life can, can be a problem if we fall in love with it. If we fall in love with our own life, then it bites its owner. If we fall in love with anything, then it will bite us. So we need to, but the thing is we have to live with these things. For example, we have to live with life, we have to live with these bodies. So the thing is to know how to live with them, know how to deal with them without falling in love. Know how to live with these things and then work with them, do what's correct, respond to them appropriately, do what needs to be done without falling in love with them. And then life will be quite joyful there will be a natural joy. Now, if it's love, then that is foolish. But if it's, it's not love, but instead it's a kind of healthy preference or to be satisfied with something or to have an, an appetite for something, that can be wise wise aspiration that can be intelligent if it's love it's it's foolish but if it's an aspiration or an appetite for what is correct that can be intelligent don't confuse contentment with love to be you know to be aware of something and to see its potential and aspire to that, to be contented with the fruits of practice is one thing. To fall in love with things, however, is another, and one should not confuse them. There's, it's possible to be contented, to be satisfied with mindfulness and wisdom. Don't confuse this with falling in love with things. Even regarding Nibbana or God, if we love these, then they will bite us. If we fall in love with Nibbana or God, then it will, it will bite us. But if we, if there's instead a contentment, 
with Nibbana, with God, with whatever, then that contentment can be mindful and wise and it won't bite. Whatever it is, money, a home, clothes, anything if, with which we fall in love will bite us. But if we associate with these things, if, we're, if we deal with these things in, and there is contentment, that contentment won't bite, but love will. One of the most principal teachings in Buddhism is that there is no permanent and unchanging self. Things are stated in this way in various talks. All things are impermanent and so the self is impermanent too. Why should this be logical? Um, is, it seems the questioner is asking the it seems the point doesn't seem to be absolutely clear or to follow necessarily from the observation that all things are impermanent. Wait a minute here. Um, the self is something that the mind creates out of ignorance. The self is just a thought, a concept in the mind created by the mind's own ignorance. This has nothing to do with logic. We're not just trying to make some philosophical statement. This is, has nothing to do with logic. It's just the way it is. Observe that the self is created by the mind's ignorant thinking. And so how could it be permanent? How can anything that is merely created by thought be, be permanent, be lasting or unchanging? It's impossible. We create these concepts and ideas of self out of ignorance. So we should then, we should create a wise self. Instead of all these ignorant selves, we should develop a wise self, an intelligent, mindful, wise self. And then they'll take care of each other. We get a cat. Mm -hmm. And then we don't have to deal with the, the rats ourselves. Just get a cat and the cat will take care of the rats and you don't have to worry about the rats yourself. So develop a wise self and let it take care of the ignorant selves. So the, we imagine the ignorant selves through ignorance. And then so we, we can speak in the same way of a wise self. But when the ignorant selves are taken care of, when they're, when they're gone, then there's just mindfulness and wisdom. It's seen that this mindfulness and wisdom is also not self. And then there's no problems, there's no, there's no more imagining that there is self or a self. It just can't be helped that self is going to be coming up all the time because this is instinctual. There's this instinct of self, so the self is going to keep coming, it's going to keep reappearing all along. So the point is not that you have to just go and get rid of that. It, it, you can't do it in that way. What can be done is to develop that, those selves, that self. Develop that so that there, it's wiser and wiser and wiser. And with this growing intelligence and understanding, then the point can come where one realizes that it's all not self, and then self disappears. But when you can't just use force or desire or belief or anything like that to, to just get rid of the self because it's instinctual. The only way is to develop the instincts, to take our natural instincts and understanding and develop it higher and higher until there is more and more wisdom, until the points, the instincts become 
what we call poti, which is um, enlightenment, awakening. And so to develop the instincts to the point that they become enlightenment, that these inherent knowledges become awakened knowledge, that's, that's the way to deal with, with self. One can't just chuck it out the window. One needs to have this approach. This is the way to transcend self. Even the instinctual self is not self. This self arising instinctually is also not self, but because of not yet knowing or not yet knowing. Ignorance doesn't necessarily mean stupidity. It can mean, it just means that we don't yet know, we don't yet understand this instinctual self. So we take it to be self. This is not, we don't have to call it stupidity, it's just we don't yet know it. And so we, we continue to take it as self. But when there is the wisdom to see that it's in fact not self, then, then the problem, the confusion disappears. We ought to make a distinction between stupidity and not knowing. Stupidity means to, to know, just to get it all wrong, to, to know something incorrectly, to see things totally wrong and make a whole mess out of it. But not knowing means that we don't yet know something. There, we don't yet know, but we see that it's possible to know. This is the important thing. In, when it's stupid, one doesn't even see the pot One thinks one knows what one doesn't, and so one doesn't even think that there's the possibility of knowing it. But in recognizing that we don't yet know, we also see the potential to know, and so we practice in order to know. And so this, this is wise and skillful, to just realize the ignorance of not yet knowing in order to know, rather than to just spin around in wrong knowing or delusion. So our instincts, although they're ignorant, don't go and consider them totally stupid. The instincts don't yet know fully or correctly, but they can be developed until the instincts become full and correct knowing. So we shouldn't go and relegate them to absolute stupidity, otherwise things become hopeless. Metaphorically, we say plant the tree of Bodhi so that it thrives and, and grows. Plant the tree of awakening so that it'll, it'll fully grow and flower. You should know that this seed or seedling of awakening is in everyone's mind. It's already there. The thing to do is to take care of it to water it and fertilize it and pr care for it so that it can thrive, so that it can grow to its, its maturity. You should know that in all life, all forms of life, animals and even plants, there is this seed of awakening, this seed of bodhi. But generally it's not planted and so it loses its efficacy, it dries up and dies. So we must, we meet, need to plant this seed of awakening and care for it so that it can grow into a tree of awakening. Nowadays our education, our ways of study are incorrect. And so in our schools, in our ways of learning, we don't plant the seed of awakening. Instead, we plant the seeds of stupidity, of selfishness. Our modern education systems are planting the seeds of selfishness rather than awakening. 
So we need to make our forms of education, our ways of learning, correct, so that instead of planting selfishness, we're planting and taking and caring for and nurturing these seeds of awakening. Okay, if if the responses aren't exactly answering your question, feel free to to raise your hand and get some more clarification. Next question. Are physical diseases caused by the mind or are they karmic? And then if the diseases are caused by the mind, can we use the mind to heal them? In Buddhism, we say that all things have their origin in mind. All things originate from the mind. And so physical diseases and illnesses have their roots in the mind. Physical ailments are due to the physical problems are because the mind is not correct. So then if the mind is correct, if things in the mind are proper, correct, then things will be fine with the body. But so when the mind is correct, things will be correct with the body as well as with the mind. Now properly we should say though we don't want to set up a dualism between body and mind. That can get confusing. So it's more proper to say that when things are spiritually correct, when mindfulness and wisdom are correct, then the body is fine and the mind is fine. For example, if we're, our minds are very tense, then it will lead to ulcers. Or if we have a lot of fear, then there will be diseases arising to fear. It could be more ulcers or it can be a necessary stress on the nervous system or heart disease or whatever. If we have excessive love, then we'll get diseases according to of that sort. Whenever the mind is incorrect, then it will create imbalances and incorrectness in the body and then that will show in various um, abnormalities of the body. Then how do we cure these can we, how can we cure these problems? Cure them by eliminating spiritual disease. Eliminate all disease of wisdom. Wisdom, when our wisdom faculty is still diseased or incorrect, then all these diseases can occur. So that means we need to study the nine das that we mentioned yesterday to investigate them until seeing them fully. These nine insights, these insight knowledges, are the way to control all disease. And when they fully cure us of the disease of self, then is, not only is there no disease, but there is no death. Begin by dealing with the small diseases and then once one has eliminated all disease, all spiritual disease, one will find then that there is no death. Even diseases which have a material origin such as um, poor sanitation or dangerous things around the home, these arise because of the foolishness of people because of the foolishness of the homeowner. So if there's any illness arising from, say, living conditions, this also comes from the foolishness of people, which is a byproduct of spiritual disease. When cars crash in the road, 
then there is spiritual disease on one side or the other, if not both. One of the drivers um, was suffering from spiritual disease, and most likely, and often both. And this is at the root of why such accidents arise through carelessness. Even malaria, mm -hmm. we don't have mm -hmm. the intelligence to mm -hmm. protect against the parasite. And so the parasite can get in and play games with us. So even this comes down to our own lack of understanding. Oh, this, here's a question about feelings. I understand that Vedana or feeling is mental and not material. Can you explain more? Does Vedana exist because of our defilements? Will physical sensations still have a pleasant quality? Um, will it still hurt? Pleasant quality, for example, having eaten the right amount of food, the stomach is relaxed or being hot or dirty, the shower cools and relieves. Um, questioner might want to explain, will still have a pleasant quality after what? Will it still hurt in the nervous system if one breaks a leg? Still, still when? <laughs> what is the difference between positive and negative in the nervous system and in feeling? The Vedana do not exist due to our de defilements. It's in fact the other way around. The defilements come from feeling, not feeling from defilements. This you can study quite easily by observing the senses. And you'll see how feeling is the starting point for, for positive and negative. Okay, when the, the sense organ, the sense object come into consciousness, sense consciousness arises, then there is contact. There's the basic experience of seeing, hearing, or whatever. And then feeling occurs. And feeling is where ignorance can um, start to function. Ignorance starts to work at feeling. And then if ignorance comes into, arises with feeling, then it develops into desire, attachment, and defilement. So this is where the positive and negative begin, with feeling. If feeling is ignorant, then this is where positive and negative begin. And out of that comes defilement. Um, defilement is not the cause of feeling. Feelings which are mixed up with ignorance, feelings accompanied by ignorance, will lead us into more and more foolishness and more and more suffering. But feelings which are free of ignorance, when there are feelings but no ignorance, this will lead the other direction to the quenching of dukkha. So you need to manage or deal with the feelings wisely. Don't let ignorance take them over. Don't let ignorance run the feelings. And then feelings can lead us to awakening, to bodhi. If there is wisdom at contact, from the moment of the mind contacting a sense object, if there is wisdom, then there won't be any ignorance to run the feelings. So we need to, we need to be right there. We need to be watching over contact so that it doesn't turn ignorant. I then asked, um, will physical sensations still have a ple pleasant quality? And I assume this means for the one who is no longer has any defilements for the awakened one. That seems to be what the question is getting at. And so, yes, the arahant, the, pers the one in whom there is no more defilement, in whom the defilements have ended, they still might, after taking a bath on a hot day or eating a proper meal, feel 
contented. They might feel the kind of physical pleasure or comfort of that will, of course, can may still be felt. Or they may even feel, respond to food as delicious or um, tasting rather unappetizing. Or see things as being beautiful or not beautiful or hear sounds as pleasant or unpleasant. This can still happen, but the key is that in spite of feeling these ordinary feelings, there's no, they're not stirred up into defilement. They're, these feelings are understood with wisdom, and so they don't turn into defilement. That's the first level of, of, of awakening. It's called the, um, the Nibbana with, with fuel remaining. There's some fuel, some of this feeling, which could catch on fire, but because there's enough wisdom, it won't catch on fire. But then there's the Nibbana with no fuel remaining. And this is where even all these feelings have been cooled. This is the higher level of Nibbana, in which the mind isn't at all disturbed by any of this beauty, ugliness, pleasant, unpleasant, feels good, feels bad kind of feeling. So there's two levels. And so on the lower level, it's still possible to be free of defilement and yet experience the feelings. Although it's a, quite a subtle and, and high dhamma, it's quite worth understanding. It's very valuable to understand the distinction between the, the awakening where there's no more defilement yet, but the feelings are not thoroughly cooled. And the awakening where there's no defilement and the feelings are absolutely cool. So there's no defilement, but the feelings aren't yet totally cool. They're cooled enough that the feelings don't get burnt, don't get light, lit up into defilement, but they're, they're not thoroughly cooled. And then there's where there's the defilements are totally gone and the feelings are thoroughly cooled. In the, in the first kind, the feelings still have a quality of positive-negative. They're still felt to be positive-negative. But this doesn't ever stir, turn into defilement. But then the second kind, <coughs> the feelings have no value of positive or negative whatsoever. Here's a simple, straightforward example. In your home, you're at home, and there isn't anything there that you love or hate. But there are still things that you consider lovely and ugly. So you still feel that some things are lovely and others are ugly, but there's nothing there that you love or hate. So you might still feel that food is delicious or that it tastes bad, but this doesn't lead to greed or hatred, anger, or any of that. But then there's a further coolness where the feelings have no, no more quality of positive and negative at all. You say Dhamma is duty. For a householder, are marriage and children duty? Of course, if, if we still live in the world, then we have the duties of the world. If we still live as householders, then we have the duty of those who live, have homes, which means a home is a place where there's family. There's, and so there's marriage and there are children. 
Now, if one has another duty, if one has left home and is living the homeless life, then of course one has other duties. But if one is living the worldly life of home, then one has the appropriate duties. So duty has its different levels and what's appropriate to it. Don't forget that the household is ultimately for homelessness. Although one lives at home, one lives in the world, one performs those duties. It's ultimately so that one can transcend them, so that one can have a mind that is homeless even while still living at home. Don't forget that the household life the household is for, ultimately, for the sake of homelessness. If we don't manage our household properly, if the household matters aren't dealt with correctly, then we've got no chance of homelessness. There's no way to, to reach that level of understanding if we can't even manage our, our checkbooks and things. Another question, what is the difference between the unconditioned, the element of quenching, nirota dhatu, between nibbana and atamayata? If we're going to speak of the differences, we need to look at the different opposites so that there are differences. Um, we can say that through fully having a dhammayata, there is nibbana. That through, when a dhammayata is perfect, then there is true nibbana, which is another name for that is the nirota dhatu, the quenching element. If a dhammayata is not yet full, then there will still be problems on the various levels. There will be problems on the sensual level. And then on higher levels, one can also have problems. So, a dhammayata, the lower levels of a dhammayata can help us to overcome the problems of sensuality. And then a higher level of a dhammayata enables us to get free of the problems on, say, material problems that aren't sensual, but just dealing with material things. And then the higher an even higher level of a dhammayata helps us to do with mental problems until stage by stage, step by step, we deal with the lower problems. And then a dhamma, a developing a dhammayata helps us to solve one set of problems and then move to the higher level. And eventually this brings us to where all problems are solved and a dhammayada is the highest a dhammayada, which brings us to the full experience of Nibbana. If a dhammayada is not yet perfect, then there is still existence or bhava. But when when Adamayada is full, then there is no more existence. But this word existence here is very difficult to understand. So we must be careful. The Pali word is bhava or in Thai pop. And we can translate it existence, but it doesn't just mean existence in the way most people take that to mean. Here, existence or bhava means the existence through ignorance, existing through ignorance, which basically means that there is some form of self. There is, when there is ignorance, there is existing as this, existing as that. When there is something evil, then there is, I am evil. When there is something good, then I am good. Or I am Thai, 
I am Farang. I am male. I am female. I am happy. I am sad. Existence means to exist in some form like this, all these different ego forms. That's what is meant by existence. So in another way we could say to identify with existence. It's not just ordinary existence, it's existence in the mind through ignorance as I am this, I am that. When Adamayada is not yet complete, then there are all these different forms of existence on, very le on rather low and crude levels to very high and exalted levels. Even in meditation, there can still be some existence as I am blissful or I am totally relaxed or something like this. But when Adamayada is perfect, then there is no more of this kind of existence. But still the heart keeps beating and stuff like that. This word, bhava, is hard to understand. Can you understand this? When your, when existence is ended, you still haven't died. Can you understand this? You can end existence, but you're not dead. If you understand this, then you will understand better what we mean by bhava. If we translate it into English as existence, then it'll be easily confused. So it's better to just use the Pali word, bhava, and then possibly we can understand its correct meaning, which is to exist through ignorance. It's to exist ignorantly as being this or being that, as being something positively or negatively. And we, we even go in, when there's existing as I am good, we see that I'm always good, or I'm always right. And then we tend to get very stuck in positive existences, positive bhavas, where we, the mind identifies with this totally as I'm always male, or I'm always handsome, or I'm always intelligent, I'm always good, and so on. So... But if you end this kind of ignorant existence, it doesn't mean that you die. Now, if there's still any bhava remaining, then there will be problems, there will be dukkha. Even if there's just a little bhava, there will still be problems and dukkha. So the Buddha used the metaphor that bhava is like feces. Even if there's just a little bit left, it will still stink. Even if you can't see where it is, it will still stink. You, have, you can't find it, you have no idea where it is, but you still smell it. And bhava is like this. Even if bhava is really subtle or tiny or small, it will, there will still be problems, there will still be dukkha. So our duty is to end bhava, which doesn't mean to die but just end this bhava and then it won't stink anymore. So if there's any kind of love, there will be problems in dukkha. If there's any kind of hate, there will be problems in dukkha. If the mind exists as this or that in any ignorant way, then there will still be problems. So we need to develop the mind to understand this so that the mind is free of ignorant existence or bhava. It's problems of bhava, of this ignorant existence, which caused you to leave your foreign countries to come to Thailand. You don't know why you came to Thailand, so we'll tell you. You came because of problems due to bhava. The problems are very deep very hard to see and so we don't see them. The end of bhava, the end of ignorant existence, is nibbana. The end of bhava is the end of dukkha, the quenching of dukkha, which is nibbana. Mm -hmm. When you see atamayata fully in its, all its aspects, 
then bhava ends totally. There's no bhava remaining. When there's no bhava, when the mind is above all this, this is called loguttara or the the super mundane. Loguttara literally means to be above uttara, the world, loka. So to be up, to transcend the world, to be above the world is the meaning of where there's no pope left, there's no bhava left. Children can understand this when they hear the end of existence, the end of bhava, they think it must mean death. But in fact, when there's no bhava, there is no death. When there's no bhava, there's nothing to die. Next question, looking at the pain, suffering, exploitation in the meat industry, our dietary needs, the economics of animal raising, etc., is it a wise choice to be a vegetarian? Okay, for these questions about vegetarianism, we need to start by making a distinction between the intention to eat for the sake of life, for the sake of survival, and the intention to kill. So first of all, we may need to make a clear distinction. The intention to eat food in order to provide nourishment for our body so that we can live, this is one intention. And if you know what intention is through practice rather than just opinions, you'll know that this is different than in the intention to kill. Now, in some cases, however, when there's the intention, sometimes the distinction is not always so clear. In the mind, the intention to, it's possible to have these very distinct but it's not always the case. For example, when somebody for the, with the intention of growing food plows a field to plant rice or corn or something, although their only intention is to plant food, to eat, in fact, a lot of death ensues. While plowing the field, countless numbers of insects and smaller organisms are killed. This, however, is not the intention of the person, of the farmer. And so it's not a sin or anything like that. But this is an excellent, this is a simple example of how, although we don't intend, although we have a pure motive or intention just to eat so that we can live, nonetheless, death can follow. Or, so this means that when we eat, the thing is just to eat for the sake of life. And that is different than going around killing things. One should be clear about the difference. The wisest approach is just to eat food. For the Buddhas and the other awakened beings, they didn't eat meat, they didn't eat vegetables. All they did was eat food correctly, just to eat the right food for the sake of life, and to eat it rightly, correctly. That is what is wise. So the highest level of practice is just to eat food correctly. Now, to be a vegetarian may solve certain problems, but it's not absolute truth. Vegetarianism is not absolute truth because there, it still involves a number of hassles and difficulties, and one can get quite righteous about it. So vegetarianism, well, it may solve many problems, but it's not absolute truth. 
The highest level is just to eat food in order to live. Now it's inevitable that there will be death to, to think that one can avoid killing things just by being a vegetarian is a little far-fetched. There are many instances, for example, when you take antibiotics or if you take pills to deal with intestinal problems, one, one kills. Now, one is not doing this, hopefully, with the intention to kill. One takes the medicine just so that one can live. One's only intention is to do one's duty. As a living being, it's our duty to live. And so we need to eat, we need to take care of our bodies. So we take medicines, and it may happen that death may come from these. Or it can happen that we're attacked by someone, and it's our duty to protect ourselves. And if in protecting ourselves, the other person dies, we haven't done anything wrong if our intention was not, as long as we were only trying to protect ourselves. Now, if we meant we intended to kill the person, that might be different. But if our only intention was to do our duty, in this case, to protect ourselves, then there is nothing, we have not done anything that is wrong. So in eating, if we eat solely for the purpose of living, then there is, there's nothing wrong in just eat food to make discriminations about this is meat, this is vegetables will, will lead to problems. Even, even when it comes to defending one's country, if one's intention is just to do one's duty, if one is just doing one's duty to protect one's country, and if in doing so people die, then one has not done anything wrong. If one is with anger, with hatred, going around intentionally killing, that's another matter. But if one's only intention is to do one's duty, such as to protect one's country, to protect other people, to protect one's own life, and then some people die because of it, one has not done anything wrong. It's a matter of what one's intention is. It's just impossible in this world that there's going to it's not possible to have there be no death. The question is whether we're intentionally killing or we're intentionally doing our duty. No matter what happens, death is going to be happening. Things are going to just keep dying. That's the way this world is. And we can't change that. But what we can do is intentionally only do what's correct, what's our proper duty rather than going around intentionally killing and harming and hurting. One little bit more about vegetarianism is that vegetarianism clearly has benefits. It's economically beneficial and it's good for health. But don't go attaching to vegetarianism as something sacred or holy, otherwise it becomes a big problem. But clearly, being a veg vegetarianism has benefits. It's less expensive. It uses resources more efficiently. It's less environmentally destructive, and so on, if done properly. And it's better for our health. But if one goes and takes it to be something really special, exalted, holy, or sacred, then all kinds of problems um, will ensue. If we try to follow the principle that we're not going to kill any living thing, then we can't do anything. We can't even breathe. 
If you decide you're not going to kill anything, then you have to stop breathing. Because when we breathe, all kinds of small lives in the air are breathed in and killed. When you walk, you step on things. You can't help it. So you would have to stop walking. When you get a skin disease, you can't use a fungicide. When you get an intestinal disease, you can't get rid of the amoebas or whatever. So to follow this principle of absolutely not killing anything, one can't do anything. So one should not be locked into some foolish ideological principle. One should not attach to this. One should just follow the principle of doing what's beneficial, doing what's right. And then in cases where vegetarianism is beneficial and appropriate, one doesn't. But one doesn't get locked into this as some absolute principle. Otherwise, it just becomes more problems. The same for soldiers who have to shoot guns. If a soldier shoots a gun just to, because that's what has to be done, there's no sin or nothing evil in that. But a soldier who shoots a gun with anger, with hatred, then there is, that is something evil or bad. So the principle of Buddhism is to live our lives with wisdom, to carry out our lives wisely, to replace ignorance with wisdom. So we recommend that you live mm -hmm. with wisdom. We come here to learn and practice meditation in order to find the way of life which is wise, to find how to live life wisely. And then life is correct and there are no problems. So this, we've used up two hours, I think, that's enough for now. So in conclusion, don't let bhava, don't let existence interfere with life. Live wisely, live correctly, but don't, but don't fall into the ideas of I am this, I am that, I am like this, I am like that. Let there just be life the body and mind functioning through wisdom, body and life that is under the direction and guidance of mindfulness and wisdom, rather than a life dominated by self, by ego. When life is above existence, then there are no problems and there is no dukkha. So in the end, living wisely is to live without Bhava. No need to be this, no need to be that, no need to be anyone or anything. Just living correctly, the body and mind living through mindfulness and wisdom. I don't know where the word human being comes from, but in Thai we use the word manut, which comes from the Pali word manutsa, ramut, manusaya, which means to have a high mind to be high-minded, to have a mind that is high above ignorance and all problems. May you all be manut, may you all be high-minded. Hopefully this, this meaning of human being will fit with the, the English word human being. So may you all be human beings. May you all return home with hearts and minds which are higher than before.